Kunaka, I'm Stanley Simpson and welcome to another episode of Reset Fiji, a platform for invigorating discussions, ideas and solutions to address the ongoing fallouts of the current pandemic. While struggling with COVID-19, Fiji was hit by a devastating cyclone. TC Herald was a reminder, if any was needed, that intense natural disasters are a constant reality in Fiji and the wider Pacific and we part, will be part of the new normal going forward. This week's panel looks at the complexities and challenges brought up by the two previous panels of Reset Fiji on economy and agriculture, and in particular, the growing tension and conflicts between people and the environment. We are seeing the increased dependency on the use of land and ocean for food security and livelihoods. With the tourism industry flatlining, there is a growing demand for natural resource exploitation, increased manufacturing and consumption rates, and the need to expand our agriculture sector. But with the plans to revive our economy, are we putting too much pressure on the environment? How do we deal with the growing pollution problems and the added, added pressures brought to us by COVID-19? Is the green initiative truly green? And as Fiji champions climate change, this panel puts us under the spotlight to demonstrate how we can transition to a more sustainable Fiji. Joining me today on the panel for the environment, we have Dr. Charles Samuai. He is a proud son of Mbua, the province of Mbua, known for their strong cover and delicious ndalo. He is also the first Pacific Islander to hold a doctorate in climate change. Uh, next to Chale is Dr. Sangita Magubai. She's the director of the Wildlife Conservation Society in Fiji. She has been working on designing marine protected areas, marine spatial planning, community-based management, coastal fisheries, payment for ecosystem services, gender inclusion in fisheries, environment policy, and climate change. Next to me, on my left, Captain Jonathan Smith, better known to many as Kipa. He is a seafarer who has, uh, who's been sailing for over 25 years and more fam famously as the first captain of the Uto Nialo. He is currently the operations manager of uh, Dive Center Fiji Limited and spends a lot of his time diving amongst the rubbish in the Suba Haba. Uh, Jody Smith is the co-founder of uh, Matanataki and director of the Earth, Earth Care Agency. Sorry. She specializes in business development uh, and turnaround and more recently on climate finance and you'll be explaining about Matanataki in your presentation. And uh, finally on the panel today, Mary Mapi Naulumatua, she's an urban planner and president of the newly formed Fiji Planners Association. She's a, a built environment history buff and an avid mountain climber. Ladies, gentlemen, Welcome to the Environment Panel, and without further ado, welcome, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to um, thank you uh, for inviting me here, Stan, and the organizers. It's indeed an honor and a privilege to, to sit among peers and discuss um, how we want to shape the future of Fiji. Eh? Also acknowledge the community leaders, the private sectors, the NGOs, the development partners, those who have been doing um, tremendous work in terms of um, the climate change space and the environment. I think my role in this panel is to talk about vulnerabilities from the perspective of climate finance. Eh? But I want to divert the, the conversation and, and talk about something else, eh? so to speak. I'm going to argue here that um, accessing more and more climate finance will unfortunately not solve the climate change solution for Fiji. As we have witnessed in the past, we've been accessing billions of climate finance. We see it coming at the national level, yet we don't see the impact on the ground. Just get to give you some facts, Fiji in the past five years have spent about two to three billion in domestic and international finance on climate change initiatives. The current gap as it currently stands based on costed uh, priorities around three billion a year. So, I want to see if the discussion for us to, um, to look at climate change from 
rather than just a resource perspective. Yeah? I think our discussion on climate change, if you're really talking about solution, it needs to transcend the micro intervention, like you know, talking stuff like mangroves, plastic bans, uh, backyard gardening, solar power. I mean, they're good, they're practical, but they unfortunately don't address the core of the problem. And if you want to talk climate change, we have to look at systems. Yeah? Climate change, I want to emphasize, is not an environmental problem. It's more than a development problem. It is a direct, direct result of a broken, flawed economic system that we have considered normal for so long. I think it's about time that we look at the challenges of our response to climate change and COVID from this lens, because at the end of the day, it is our economic model that is the machinery that provides a direction on how development is done in Fiji. We have to understand that the neoliberal economic model that drives our development, especially in the case of Fiji, is rooted in colonialism ideologies. We see this in the type of um, development thinking that have drive, that have drove our economic development in the past, the thinking that sidelines well-being, communities and environment, and prioritize the needs of corporations, of elites, and others. And also, if you look at it, our, um, our economic model is, is specifically designed for, for donors, and the corporate elites, and it's, it's not designed to cater for the, for the people, especially the vulnerable. And uh, if you look at the flip side of this, it has brought us development, yes, it's good, but on the other side of the coin, it's also brought us um, massive destruction in terms of our lands, our ocean. And um, because we have been um, seeing this as the norm, we have become too sensitized to the cost that this kind of ide ideology of development has extracted from our communities and from our environment. And in a way, I'm glad that COVID has happened. It has acted as a mirror for most of us, especially the privileged people whose work influences the development of Fiji. And I'm speaking here to government, to NGOs, to development partners, and to academia. COVID reveals to us our collective failure to actually do right to safeguard the environment, and most importantly, protect those that are truly vulnerable and marginalized in communities. We have failed, not because what is required of us is impossible, but rather we have failed because we have not really radically reimagined a future that is just and fair for all. We talk about big concepts such as transformational change, innovation, paradigm shifts, agility, reset, rewind, reimagine, and all sorts of risks. And yet when you look around, the poor are still poor, the marginalized are still marginalized, and the vulnerable are still vulnerable. And this needs to change. And if we don't, then there's a, and if you look at the current situation that's in Fiji, those that are living on the extreme will be pushed further and further into the cycle of poverty. And there's a real danger that 120,000 people are going to join that group if the continuous job loss in Fiji uh, continues. And the point that I'm stressing here, and it has been highlighted by the two panelists, the past show, the problem is systemic in nature, and it, this is the core of the issue that we must speak to. We, must, we need to be bold, transparent, and inclusive in the discussion on the ideologies, on the various assumptions, structural intents, which most of our formal governance system and institution that governs the thinking behind our, our development. COVID, I think, has given us as an opportunity as a nation to critically reflect how far we have come, or depending on how you see it, how far we have regressed as a nation. It is giving us an opportunity to reevaluate who and where we should be looking to as a nation for guidance in these difficult times. It's making us reevaluate as well the kind of question we've been asking in relation to development, whether we have been asking the right kind of question to the right kind of people. And if you watch the previous show, the richness and the practicality of the solution that the panelists have spoken about clearly shows that the answer lies within. It lies within our local people, not expensive expatriates and consultants, 
But this idea of looking within is not new. I mean, it's common sense. And yet, we see from the powers that be in our country this obsession of hiring so-called foreign experts who to a larger extent don't fully appreciate the complexity, the realities of local level, and in some instance, devalue this local knowledge simply because it's coming from people that don't fit certain academic credentials and to some extent, skin color. I also want to point out here, this whole idea of reset, to my understanding, is that we are about it's about envisioning a new Fiji. But I want us to pause for a minute and ask the question. Again, I'm asking those privileged people in working in development and the powers that be who dictates our development trajectory, uh, sorry, direction. Whose vision are we really talking about here? Whose vision should be prioritized? Whose idea of progress should be prioritized? If we don't question our bias, and more importantly, question our privileges, then we are just reinforcing a vision of the future that is linear in nature and continues to support the existing power imbalances in society. So what does Fiji need to do? For me, I really think we need a fundamental shift of our governance structures, our decision-making processes, our risk appetite, and the way that we work to embarrass embrace the type of change that we need. And for this to happen, we need bold political leadership. Leadership that is committed to radically overhauling this system and the institution that are meant to protect and uphold the public good. Our leaders must have the courage to make national decision, even though that it might make no sense, economic sense. We need leaders to move away from viewing everything from an economic perspective and make that decision because it is the right thing to do for this country. Voice is again critical. Again, I'm asking the question here, in terms of those who work in this space, influencing the development of this country, those who have the power of influence, whose voices should we be listening to? Who should be sitting here at the table but is missing from this kind of talk? Are we really ready to listen, to hear them? I mean, really listen to the people or are we just talking amongst our privileged bubble? How do we articulate ourselves as a nation? And if you were to apply such critique in Fiji, in terms of the critical forum that is determinative of general well-being, it is those rural women, the disabled, the indigenous community, the youth, the LBGTQI community, the faith-based organization, who are always missing. All these voices are either being muted or distorted. And this has to change if a move towards a just and fair future that we are trying to reimagine here have some credible resonance. It's high time we stop talking about the vulnerable and the marginalized in society and instead listen to them. We must do better in listening if this whole talk of reset impulse were to have meaning and be able to be carried forward. And thirdly, we need radical inclusion that, and recognize that it's about time that we bring those voices that have de been devalued and not paid attention to for so long into the core of our development solution formulation. Because like I previously mentioned, these are the people that have common sense solution built from everyday experience that Fiji needs right now. Fiji don't need big ideas. They need common sense ideas. We need voices like that of Mr. Wasing, Mr. Tora, Ms. Sashi, and other panelists. And for our list, uh, leaders to really listen to these voices and to make the courageous step to implement those suggestions and so that we can begin the shift to the future that we need. The pandemic has, yes, like you mentioned, Stanley, revealed the systematic vulnerabilities of our governance system, but it has also revealed the strength of the resilience of our local community. It re-emphasized the fact that we Fijians have always known, yet the powers that be and those that hold the purse and the, st and the string in terms of the resources that are channeled into our communities still seem to ignore. Community re uh, resilience, to me, to a large extent, is linked to natural resources. Again, it raises a point that has been discussed last week of the role of agriculture and food security. I don't think I need to reiterate here the critical role of this sector. But if you are saying that agriculture is our way out, I think we need to understand that agriculture in itself, since we are talking about it in the context of climate change, has a huge impact on our national environment. 
it raises the question on how do we strike a balance between large-scale agriculture and conserving our natural environment. For me, the solution lies in climate-smart agricultural practices, the use of science and data and technology to drive this industry. But these need to be supplemented by the traditional and the local knowledge in communities because our local people have been toiling these lands for centuries in perfect sync with nature. I really do agree that agriculture right now is, the, is critical in stabilizing our economy. It's for, it is therefore really sad to see that the only big idea that we keep talking about in this country are bubbles, despite local experts to look at other alternatives and the overwhelming evidence that laser travel will be the last thing to recover when the pandemic wanes. Shifting people's attitudes, perception, and confidence about international and travel will take time. I think it's about time for Fiji, especially those that are advising our leaders to look beyond the economics of solution and for once consider social aspects that are critical for Fiji to guide their decision making. And my final point here is the need to reimagine our education system. As we are talking about development, development as put by Dr. Tasias Tabukaulaka, it is an idea an idea that creates an image of what we want to become. And because it is an idea, the ideal place where we should be channeling our investment is our education system. Our education system have been for so long instilled this notion that when you go through this formal process, there is an office, there is a white collar job waiting for you. We train our people to think that working in offices is the only way for a better life. We devalue instances of curriculum that deals with, for example, agriculture. In fact, I still vividly remember that whilst in high school, students, colleagues who take agriculture are often scorned at. They are often considered as not so smart, if you look at it within the context of our formal education system. No wonder, no wonder you see a lot of our disenfranchised youth who come out of this education system and are finding out that what we have sold them is not real. Because these youths have been conditioned to think that a white collar job or to have a formal job is the only way out or is the only way to make a better living. And they end up where? They end up in these rural squatters, these settlements without, you know, it's hard for them to return to their communities and actually work the resources that they own to better their livelihood. And therefore, we need to relook at our curriculum Relook at the question that we are teaching our children. Relook at the kind of leaders we, that we want our children to be. You know, a famous Itauke idiom resonates to me here as a close. Meaning that you can only change behavior and thinking of people when they are young. I think this is where we need to start this process of resetting Fiji. It also speaks to a broader truth of the kind of reset that Fiji wants. It has to start with you and me. If you want to reset Fiji, you must first reset your individual behavior. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Charles Samuai. I think we are off to an explosive start there with all the, all the points that you've made. I have some questions for that, but uh, I think I'll leave it to uh, Dr. Sangita, the Director of uh, Wildlife Conservation Society Fiji, to build on that and, uh, and, and share her points with us. Okay. So um, I agree with our previous uh, first speaker and that the global COVID-19 pandemic is actually forcing us to recognize the failures in our social and our economic systems. And while the initial focus has been very much around the health crisis itself, governments all around the world, we're starting to see this real widening of scope to start looking at the economic effects from market disruptions. And this pandemic has had a really unprecedented impact on so many different sectors, including the coastal fisheries sector, which is what I would like to focus on a bit. So let me just give you a little bit of context. So, you know, during the lockdowns, so what we found was that uh, a lot of fishers, they weren't able to go out and earn an income. And we know from studies that we've been doing in partnership with the locally um, managed marine area network, where we've called up fishers over the telephone to ask them you know, what are they going through, that they aren't going, able to go out fishing, they aren't earning an income, and they don't have that 
uh, enough savings or FNPF that they can tap into. At the same time, this drop in tourism has meant that our seafood markets has really, really shrunk significantly. And the prices have actually dropped. And we know that there's been something like a 36, uh, on average, a 36% drop in the sort of um, income and the prices um, around our seafood. We've also seen in some of the newspaper articles increased number of fishes as a result of growing unemployment. And tropical cyclone Harold, of course, has caused damage to boats and to fishing gear for a number of our fishing communities. So I think what we need to think about is that what we have here is a crisis within a crisis. And we have to start learning from our experience as our, as our base. We've got to learn from the past and how we've dealt with past natural disasters and economic disruptions. And we've generally seen that after these big events, there is this increased pressure on natural resources. And as countries, and including Fiji, start to look at economic recovery, economic growth. But how do we move forward and reset Fiji? How do we set a new and better norm, rather than just returning to the old ways, which frankly, I agree, just really are not working? So I'm going to suggest for the fisheries sector, and specifically coastal fisheries, that we really need to build and invest in resilient coastal fisheries. And by this, what I mean is that to be resilient means keeping our fisheries healthy so that they can actually withstand these shocks like cyclones, like climate change, economic disruptions, so that they can continue to provide food and livelihoods for our people. And when I talk about these resilient coastal fisheries, I'm not just talking about the people who are actually collecting the fish, but everyone who's sort of involved in the sector, from the person that's collecting it, someone who's processing it, up to the seller that you as a, or we as a society might be buying from. And so we really need to not only reset the way that we use our resources, but also how we manage the fisheries themselves. And I just want to give you three examples of, I think, actions and thought, things that we need to be thinking about. Firstly, we've got to maintain good fisheries management practice. This is absolutely not the time to be lifting restrictions and bans that we have in place that are put in place to actually protect the long-term investments in those fisheries. Fish can continue to provide us our nutrition and income for the duration of this crisis, but we now need to take extra care that we're not damaging those habitats, we're allowing those fish to breed, reach the sizes before we harvest them. Secondly, when it comes to our fisheries, I think we've got to stop thinking about them in silos, disconnected from the habitats, disconnected from the ecosystems, and also disconnected from that wider development that is happening in the country. Actions really have consequences. So doing things like cutting mangroves so that we can support economic development in one sector, we have to start understanding there's a price, a consequence that, for that. So for example, in that example, there's a consequence for coastal fisheries. Thirdly, I'm going to suggest when it comes to, the seafood, comes to our seafood, we've got to start thinking a little bit more cleverly about how we invest locally. So rather than rush out and create economic markets, you know, create this flurry of economic activity, we need to think about if we create these economic markets, and especially export markets, how do they compete with our own food security? So I think what we need to be thinking about as we invest locally is how do we bolster local food networks, our local supply chains, and how do we create socially responsible real partnerships with the private sector that are invested here in Fiji? And I think I'm going to just want to end on, because I know we've got a great opportunity to have a bigger discussion. What I want to say is that I think it's a really challenging time because we have to simultaneously be planning for the short term and the long term at the same time. In the short term, our responses need to be swift, they need to be effective, and they need to be targeted to the most vulnerable, the, the fishers, the people in the sector that really need our help and support. But in the longer term, there really needs to be this much more coordinated, well thought out response in how we transform our existing institutions, how do we transform our supply chains, how do we transform our food systems 
in a way that improves the conditions and helps to build this resilience of the coastal fisheries sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of uh, practical solutions, practical proposals there. I'll open it now for one or two questions. In fact, I'd like to, um, to touch on one question before I take one from the audience. You both have mentioned about the systems. So I think uh, one simple question when you ask, uh, you know, almost you see here the words change the system. In very simple terms, how do we change the system? And where are, what are the examples of systems that have been changed? If we can touch on that before I take a question from the panel. Please put your hands up if you want to be recognized. No? Uh, thank you, Stan. The systems that I was referring to is, is generally this, the ideology that drives our um, development, this neoliberal economic system, uh, sorry, economic way of thinking that prioritizes profit, that, that basically says that, you know, you have to reduce government spending on social welfare, that everything has to be driven by the market. It, it uh, promotes uh, market liberalization. Um, it also, um, um, <clears throat> you know, it's basically what I'm referring to here is the governance. How do we think about the way that we should be developing Fiji? So that ideology, if you look at it, the structures that implements that kind of thinking is basically our institution, the way that we make decisions. And I was arguing the need for this system to be re-looked at in terms of how wide do we want to consult, in terms of who, whose voices should be included. Because if you look at it, in these voices, in this space, those who are dictating the way that we should be moving are usually elites, corporations, and from there you usually, usually see that the people on the ground are usually um, missing. So, so basically, that's, that's basically the, the, the system that I was referring to. And I think uh, in terms of shifting it, I've alluded to, you need bold economic decision, uh, sorry, um, um, political leadership in terms of government recognizing that we don't need a government approach to climate change, we need a country-wide approach. When I say country, I mean everybody. Everybody needs to fit into or rather contribute to the solution because this is a country-wide problem, it's not a government problem. So, yeah, that's basically the, the system I was referring to in terms of the way that we govern our development. I hope that clarifies. All right. And there are some really good examples of countries who have done well with this. So Costa Rica is a good example. I believe it was in the 1940s they brought in some really strong policy that was to support social inclusion and welfare. Uh, I believe they also disbanded their military and they started directing that money into education and into healthcare. And now in the 2000s, in the 21st century, they don't have a very high per capita GDP, but they, in terms of wellness uh, indexes, they rank as highly as Scandinavian countries. So I think they offer a really interesting example. Thanks for that input, Jody. Uh, I'll take a question from the floor. Please uh, introduce yourself and uh, where you're from and their question. Nakam Bulubinakam Seteto Tamanikairoi from the Fiji Development Bank. Uh, thank you for, to the organizers for this session and also to the panelists. For us at the bank, we are the current direct access entity for GCF. And we've uh, been trying to uh, access fund. And I'm happy to acknowledge and say that we have been able to. Our first funding proposal is before the GCF board right now for a decision, which is a project down in Ovalau. Uh, combining uh, renewable energy and uh, agriculture, which we're working with a private company, uh, also Quaker and, uh, and GCF. The, the real challenge that we face is accessing the finance. We do have the access, but it's taking it down to the community level. So we've had people, uh, organizations, um, communities, a private sector coming to us, but it's the, before you can actually get to submit a concept note, you need to incur some expenses huh? to do a pre-feasibility study. And these things are pretty expensive because to do a concept note, you need to quantify um, the carbon emission or how much reduction it'll 
that particular program or project that you are intending to do will bring, bring, bring that about. Eh? So most of them don't have the money to actually do these um, pre-feasibility studies just to get on board or to come and have a decent discussion with us at the bank. So my question really is, what is your advice on how we can solve that, that gap, before we can actually access funding such as Green Climate Fund? Naka. Thank you. Um, for that question, um, in terms of finding finance to do your uh, pre-activities yeah, before you access the fund, I think this is where government need to, to think innovatively in terms of how do we leverage um, public finance and, and try and, um, and use public finance to, to leverage um, private finance. Um, that is one in terms of um, setting the right kind of environment, business environment, which will, which will um, induce or rather encourage the private sector to, to take charge. I think that's one. And also for me, um, we, we have to look at the fact that the communities are not poor. They actually own resources. Yeah? I think that's unique to Fiji. We own our lands, we own our ocean. But the, the idea of how do we convert these resources into finance, I think, is missing. And I think that's where training needs to be done. And also in terms of um, seed funding from government to encourage this kind of thinking to natural uh, resource owners that they are not poor, they own resources. It's, just, it's about looking at these natural resources that they own and thinking innovatively on how do we drive or rather derive um, money out of it. I think that to me would be, I mean it's long term in nature, but it's a start. Eh? To shift the ideas that you are not poor, you own resources, this is how you should go about doing it. But I think in terms of that kind of solution, um, it needs a collective wide thinking in terms of how do we really make use of our own resources to finance the kind of activities that uh, we want. All right, I think climate financing, I think that's, a, that's an interesting point that we will uh, probably return to uh, later in the discussion. For now, I think taking us uh, to the ground and uh, to the sea, I'd like to invite uh, Captain Jonathan Smith to uh, give his uh, brief. Well, everybody, thank you, uh, Mr. Simpson. Just listening to um, Dr. Charlie there just now brought back some memories of uh, just drifting away from what I was supposed to say was, uh, since I remember, around about 2000, my ship got arrested in Bangladesh and we spent four months under arrest there. I was one of 18 Fijians. And when we finally came home after four months, I got this big spiel on the plane by the minister at that time. You must say this, you must say that. Government did this, government did that. And when I came out and saw my family, I was like, everything just went out of my head. And that exactly came to my mind. I said, there should be no poverty here in Fiji. That's the first thing that came to my mind and that has stuck. And um, Dr. Charlie is right. You know, um, but it's not too late. It's not too late to fix. It's not too late to press that reset button. Um, we can get it done. Okay? We've practically wrecked our environment so bad that only now, during this COVID-19 um, pandemic, people have realized that they need to find food. So now, when you go to Rokombili over there, when you come down Reservoir Road, you never see anybody there before during low tide. But these last couple of months, you're seeing people out there on the mud flats um, looking for Kaikoso and all of these things. But you never used to see that before. Wailolo Beach in Nandi. I went to work there in Wailolo Beach. And during the low tide, people are out there now scoring for Kaikoso and seashells and anything they can find. Okay? We can repair what we've damaged. There's no time like right now to start. Now, if we had looked after and respected our environment like our ancestors did from way back, we wouldn't be having any of these problems right now during this pandemic. Everybody would be happy. But because you could go and buy stuff off the shelf, or you, know, you didn't have to depend on the land or the sea for food, you didn't worry about it. 
But now that you can't buy stuff off the shelves, you want to turn back to the land and the sea and there's nothing there. Either there's nothing there, it's all dead. Okay, so like uh, Dr. Charlie was saying, back in the old days, there was time to till the land, right, to plant a certain crop and things like that. Right? They didn't use uh, paraquat and gramaxone and all these weed killers that did an amazing job. Everybody thought it was a wonder chemical that would kill off weeds and everything. Right? Not, not realizing what it did for the marine environment. Okay, um, a short story in Ngao, in Somosomo. Uh, when I first uh, was used to sail to Somosomo in Ngao, there was beautiful reef coral over there when you're coming into the bay in Somosomo in Ngao. Then all of that ended up dying away. You had big algae blooms and lumi and all these kind of things. And I just happened to have a group of scientists um, on board. By the way, Sangita and I used to sail before too. So. <laughs> Um, people in the likes of Dr. Mangubai, who used to sail with me and do all their reef research and everything. And one of them says, oh, they must be using something up on the land that's coming down into the ocean. And then they found out that it was, you know, Gramaxone or Paraquat or something. During heavy rain, it all got washed into the bay and it killed the reefs. So they stopped using that and now the reefs have bounced back. So you can see the environment can actually repair itself. It's just up to us to actually help um, with that repair, right? And they didn't have plastic bottles and plastic bags way back in the day. Everything was reusable or organic. So now with all of these coming in, and you know, by the way, plastic bags are not that bad, right? It's only bad because we haven't been disposing of it or using it rightly. And now and then it's killing the reefs and mangroves and everything that we realize that something's wrong. So it's really up to us how we, um, how we handle all of these things. Um, another thing I've looked at is our seafood. We all love our seafood. Uh, so tell me one Fijian who doesn't like seafood. Okay. Gone are the days when you have to go out to get seafood, you just fish off the beach or go to the nearest ndongo to catch crabs. You can't do that anymore. You can't go out into the sand flats and get seethi and all that stuff. And we wonder why. We blame climate change and every other excuse under the sun. The Department of Environment, Department of Fisheries, we blame everybody else. Okay? But all of these things can't stay alive if we don't look after the environment. If we trash it with plastics and kill, you know, and dredge and silt from the rivers up in the mountains from uh, mining or whatever. You know, all these quarries and stuff that are mining gravel and stuff up the rivers. Right, so all of these stuff that we love can't live in trash. So how do you expect that to be able to stay around? Right, so it's all really up to us. Whatever you throw on land ends up in the ocean. And believe me, I've seen a lot. I've been diving for over 20 years. Um, I've been diving you know, quite a few places all over the world. And I've seen how a healthy reef looks like, how a clean island looks like, and how beautiful you know, Palau, if anything, Fiji has to follow Palau the islands of Palau. Now their land is so clean that the sea is very clean, right? And I didn't have high expectations of Palau when I went there, I was sent there to work, and it just blew my eyes wide open. I said, this is what we need here in Fiji, right? Their way of doing things. You stand on the main wharf where the big container ships come alongside and you look down, you can actually see fish and everything that 10 meters, 15 meters down off the main wharf. Over here on this main wharf, all you're seeing is uh, oil and rubbish and styrofoam containers. And when I come up from diving over here, you know, I got to purge my regulator while surfacing because you know, there's oil above me or rubbish or something that I need to clear before I surface. Otherwise, I just get coated in it. And, you know, these are what some of the things that I've been fighting personally. I don't belong to an NGO or a government department or anything. I just do it personally because it's my passion to get the harbor back to what it was before, get our seas back to what it was before. Um, I've been out at sea from when I was a kid, fishing, diving, everything, so I know what stuff looks like before and after. Right, so. So all I want to say is, um, my message I would like to leave with you today 
is look after your own personal environment. That's what should be taught to everybody and everyone and every village should be responsible for their own personal environment. Because all of this environmental damage and plastics and everything didn't come from the government or the Department of Environment, it came from us. Right? So education, I believe, is one of the most important things that we need to teach and keep on teaching, not just teach once and then leave it. Okay, so in order to have a clean and healthy environment, to supply us with an abundance of seafood and food and health and healthy air and not everything, we need to be personally responsible, each individual. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Skipper. That was, uh, I'm sure we all agree, quite uh, revealing, uh, eye-opening. I think we knew a lot of this, but when you hear from someone who actually sees it, when diving in the ocean. Um, before I move on to Jody uh, Smith, if you can just explain, uh, I saw you in the news recently with the Attorney General and the, I think the Minister for Environment talking about uh, something you had introduced uh, to help contain the rubbish, because a lot of this is about waste management, as you said. If you can explain that before we continue to, uh, with Jody. Um, yes, uh, it's, uh, I had this idea of a trash net uh, way back and um, the Department of Environment uh, called me up and asked for the idea and how we can use it and everything and that they would pay for it and all that. So um, I got together with uh, Mr. Colin Phillip, who was um, our sail master on the Utonialo also back then and um, who owns a polystry business. And we got the plan together and we managed to make up a rough trash net to try and get into the rivers and we did get that done. And um, Initially, it was um, put there just to see how much rubbish would come down the Bailey Bridge. So if you're passing over Bailey Bridge, you'll see these big nets in the Bailey Bridge. They're not actually blocking off the whole river. And um, I think the Department of Environment is employing the local fishermen from there to keep it clean and um, to um, stack everything into these big bulk bags that will be... What's the word am I looking for to study or to see statistics, you know, what's the rubbish inside there and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's been working well and we hope to get that all around Fiji to all the main rivers um, and creeks that uh, have a lot of rubbish in it so that you can actually see. Because looking at one plastic cup floating down the river doesn't look like much until you see a whole bunch caught in the net and then it opens up your eyes to see how much rubbish is actually in there. Um, you know, diving in the Tamavuewai River, um, we're working on the piles down the bottom there. All you can see down there is just, um, you know, diapers and rubbish and you name it, it's down there. And one thing here in Fiji, one bad mentality we have is out of sight, out of mind. Okay? Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. A lot of people like to take uh, photos at the Suva Seawall, beautiful sunset. We have no idea what's on the seabed there. I can stick my hand this far into the seabed and I can pull out, you know, packets of chip papers and whatever, UFO, twisties, all those kind of things, you know, it's just, and that's from years and years, you know, so all these kind of things here, uh, people just throwing it in the water, expecting it, once it disappears, that that's it. And this is all what we're doing. We need to stop all of that and um, actually educate. We need to educate them why it's not good. Just not, don't do it, you know that. Thank you, Skipper. Now, uh, can we have a presentation from Jody Smith, as I mentioned earlier, co-founder of Matanataki and director of the Earth Care Agency. Got that right now. Thank you. I'll begin with some Talanoa, uh, an experience I had last year. So I was visiting Lambasa and I was looking for businesses to develop for green investment. I was staying at an apartment on the main road and I was woken around midnight by this stream of trucks just hurtling down the main road. And they didn't stop until morning. Well, that week that I was in Lambasa, I had a lot of time to think because I didn't sleep at all. Uh, it was the cane harvesting season. So that week, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about my great-great-grandfather. He was the first Chinese man in Fiji, and he was forced to leave his home, which was ravaged by war. There was a very big trade deficit between China and the West. Does that sound familiar to anyone? 
Um, and he came to Fiji because he had heard of the great natural wealth of the country. Uh, there was a new sugar industry, there was sandalwood, sea cucumber, very prized in his homeland. So wide awake in the middle of the night in Lombasa town, I was struck by a very troubling thought. My work too, indeed that very day, involved sugar, sandalwood, and sea cucumber. And I felt like so little had changed. You know, I want to echo what you were saying, Charlie. We are still living the effects of colonization. And in fact, colonization and globalization really are the same. Um, and aid, I think, doesn't help. Uh, a, um, a study by the Norwegian School of Economics, which came out in 2016, showed that for every dollar of aid that flows from the global north to the so-called global south, uh, $24 of net losses go from the south to the north. So that's resources, capital, flight, trade, misinvoicing, uh, mis etc. cetera. But the thing is, you know, today is so different to when my great-great-great-grandfather was here 160 years ago. Today we have extracted so much that the current, at the current rate of soil degradation, we only have 60 harvests left ever. That's 60 years left of harvesting from our soil. And in 30 years, 90% of coral reefs globally are going to be dead. You know, and if we don't stop local threats, our great sea reef, which is the greatest piece, the most important piece of infrastructure that we have in this country, and it's living infrastructure, if we don't stop the local threats to that reef, we are going to lose this important thing that feeds, provides income, protects from natural disasters for, over, for more than a third of our population. And additionally, the Great Sea Reef, it provides 65% of Fiji's foreign exchange earnings. It provides 40% of Fiji's GDP. Who in the audience and on the panel has children aged 10 or younger? Can I get a show of hands? Anyone with kids who are 10 or younger? So the Great Sea Reef and other coral reefs around the world are on track to be dead by the time your children are between the ages of 30 and 40. This is really, really soon. And you know, what they will experience is far worse and will be far more permanent than what we're experiencing with COVID right now. So we've really got no choice but to change the story. So how am I working to do that? So, as I was introduced, I represent a partnership called Matanataki. Matanataki is the Fijian word for action. We bring impact investment to sustainable, regenerative businesses, and we also help investors identify investments. So this type of investment is quite new but it is looking set to become the new norm. BlackRock, which is the biggest fund manager in the world, they announced at the beginning of this year uh, that they are focusing the majority of their investments towards sustainability. So the rationale for uh, myself and my partners is that the old model doesn't work, and we've seen countless examples of this. Uh, money comes in piecemeal. It usually comes in either through uh, low interest loans, uh, through, uh, and these loans are often conditional, often in, of involve economic adjustment policies that need to be brought in, uh, or it comes in through aid, and it's so piecemeal that it doesn't last long. So we'll see really great projects happening but when the money runs out the project falls over so our thinking is that through business and through incentivizing business we can change this so we have screened 120 businesses in the last approximately year and a half in Fiji and of that 120 we've found about 37 that we believe can give a really viable uh, financial return and environmental return um, we've identified approximately a 75 uh, million US dollar investment need for those 37 businesses. 
And so I'll give an example of what that type of business and across a supply chain or in a sector might look like. Uh, we have been able to arrange the financing for a sanitary landfill and materials recovery facility solution for the west of Fiji. Um, so in phase one, this would involve uh, the Venato dump being closed, uh, a new sanitary landfill being built, and then refuse transfer stations for Reki Reki, Tavua, Ba, Nandi, and Singatoka, all replacing the open dumps. So waste can be brought to these refuse transfer stations, and then there would be a network of GPS-tracked trucks taking the waste from the transfer stations to the new sanitary landfill. That's stage one. That costs around about 16 million Fijian dollars. Stage two is a materials recovery facility. Once that is built, and that's around about a six to seven million Fijian dollar investment, then we can start separating our materials. And that's when our waste can start becoming a resource. And from there, stage three, ancillary businesses in recycling and upcycling. And there we can create new industries. And we're talking to some entrepreneurs about some really exciting ideas, like taking plastic waste, not just from Fiji, but from the region, and creating things like plastic bitumen that we can use to fill potholes. So these ideas, they're really exciting. And to me, they really shift our thinking away from extraction. So my thoughts on resetting Fiji. So for me, it's not really so much of a reset, although there are a couple of things I would like to reset, but mostly it's action. So I come back again to this idea of Matanataki. We've had Talanoa and Talanoa is important, but we know what to do, so let's get to work. So I would like to see all new investments geared towards regenerative business. And the mantra should be that money invested needs to generate not just financial return, but it needs to generate environmental return, and we need to measure that environmental return. And here, when I talk about investment, I'm talking bonds, public spending, pension investments, debt investment, equity investment, and aid and donor money. And Satata, to your question, I think it would be great to see some of that money channeled into these feasibility projects because these businesses are viable. They just need the support to get in front of investors to unlock further capital. Um, the government has done a fantastic job of establishing Fiji as a climate change leader in the world. Everyone knows about Fiji. I talked to our European investors. They want to invest into Fiji because of what Fiji represents and what Fiji has done on the global stage. So now it's time for business to act and business needs government support to do that. I'd also love to see more public-private partnerships developed and they need to be developed by people who really deeply understand business, understand finance and investment. And I want to see support for regenerative businesses of all sizes in waste, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, tourism, renewable energy and transport. And to start really letting these entrepreneurs shine. They have amazing ideas, but they lack the experience that you need to get in front of these investors. So let's bridge that gap. And lastly, the innovations that I would love to see, and I am seeing them with the, the people I speak to, and this is the part of my job I love, I'm so inspired by the people who I get to work with on a daily basis. These ideas are smart and they're future-proof. And they are not trucks hurtling down a road with sugarcane in 160 years' time. These are new innovative ideas that are gonna place Fiji at the forefront of regeneration and value provision. Uh, my two resets, um, I want to see more girls educated to be in business. I think that we as girls and women, we understand cycles, we understand regeneration innately. So let's make it easy for girls to get to the top in business. Let's make it as easy for them as we do for boys. And then this is coming back to Charlie's point, um, the economic model is a major, major problem. We need people participating in that conversation, and that's a global conversation, and we need to, um, we need to let GDP as a measure for growth go, because GDP as a measurement of our economic growth, it relies on unsustainable resource extraction. So let's replace this GDP measure with an equity measure. 
Um, and then just lastly, um, you know, COVID and the climate crisis have presented a really unique opportunity for us to change the story. But the story really has to come from action. And again, that's why Matana Taki. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Uh, just a quick question from me. Um, how easy is it to access climate financing, environment financing? Like some of the numbers you've mentioned, if someone's in the audience listening to all the great ideas mm. and the numbers you've mentioned, how does one go about it? It's not easy, um, and I'll tell you why it's not easy, because the Pacific's very small and investors are wanting bigger investments. When I first started speaking to uh, investors about this, they were saying things to me like, we wouldn't touch Fiji unless a major off-taker like Unilever is present in the country, or unless you have a palm oil plantation which wants to go organic and has 10,000 hectares. Um, so we really have to uh, position ourselves very smartly. So when we go out and we look for investors, we look for investors who have some personal connection to the region. That really helps. Um, and we have to come up with these ideas which are marketable ideas as well because the investors do want a story. But I think that's one thing we have to bear in mind. We are, uh, you know, investors want to invest in Latin America and, and South America. East Asia, so we just have to come up with these really clever ideas which, um, which, which sell a story. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for that. At this stage, I'd like to just, uh, talk about our uh, Reset Fiji poll. We've been running polls after every presentation or ahead of every presentation, um, every series panel. Uh, just from the running poll for the environment panel. Thank you, Stanley, and um, thank you for this opportunity to um, speak about the built environment. Now, when this topic of environment and climate change was presented to me, I, I imagined that most people think of the natural environment. We, we rarely think of the built environment, which works around the natural environment, trying to safeguard um, public health as, as aspects of the built environment. But one thing I'd like to also just bring out there is that parts of the town planning regulation was born out of the need to curb a waterborne disease many, many, many years ago when we were still in the olden days, um, night soil would be put out in the street or just um, poured into any drains and then a night soil collector would come and then so reticulated systems were um, designed and then the width of streets and that's how town planning started taking in how do we manage our waste. Um, fast forward to the 21st century and we are grappling with yet another disease, but this time it's an airborne disease, you know, disease and short of a cure, we're slapped with directives being to wash hands, the physical distancing and the lockdown. So my question came up as to how has this COVID-19 exposed the vulnerabilities of the built environment? Um, so going back to the washing hands part, that, that was a big assumption that, that all of us have access to safe water throughout the day. Some of us may have it only from 8 to 4 or not at 10 p.m. Um, do we have access to water in a safe place? Is it well lit? Um, is it even indoors? Some people may have to go outdoors for water. The second one, uh, the physical distancing portion. Um, can the current designs of our houses, our workplaces, public transport, our public places, can they accommodate the requirements of the physical distancing? So we go, go down to our open spaces, our footpaths. Can we maneuver ourselves easily around? Is it, you know, we don't go tripping ourselves because of the simple design of um, open spaces. And, and the last most dramatic one was the lockdown. Um, could we, that, another uh, assumption was that we all could work from home and that clearly was not an option for many of us. Could, could a town survive in lockdown indefinitely? So uh, it was interesting to see when Lautoka was in lockdown it wasn't the local council that uh, mobilized people, it was the Ratepayers Association that took the initiative to mobilize and help those within the community who were in need. So that 
you know, really, it was good to see that the community could rally around themselves because, you know, they see each other every day, they, they know each other, they are family, they work together, and it was easier just rallying around to help each other in a time of crisis. And, and in this crisis or time of uncertainty, as I call it, the th three basic needs remain, and that's shelter, food, and water. As much as we are worried about employment or if we're going to see you know, friends and families, these three basic needs remain. And so going, um, before I go into my wonderful ideas, I'd, I'd just like to set the scene of where an urban planner comes from. We look at statistics and data. So just for Fiji, we have an almost, uh, a population almost uh, 900,000. Not, not a million just yet. 53% of that is urban, spread across 13 towns, 11 towns and two cities. 20% of that urban population live in informal settlements. So that's one in five of us. And the median age is 27 years old. So in my view, there's quite a few clever people around, I'd like to say. Um, so going back to... Uh, some of the issues or my main key points that I'd like to um, bring out here is that the informal settlements, as you, see, you know, can see that it's, it's taking up quite, a, uh, they take up a bit of our in, um, community. We need to acknowledge that informal settlements are a part and parcel of the urban fabric. We can't afford to be pushing them aside because they take part in the economic activities in the city. They pay taxes, they participate in informal um, sector. So we need to acknowledge that, but at the same time, the reason, you know, we all have reasons to come to the city. My parents have come to the city. It was for education, health, jobs. But the thing is, it, we haven't been able to keep up to the, to the demand for affordable residential zoned land. There is a lot of land out there, but it needs to be serviced. And if we need to subdivide for residential purposes, they need to be serviced with reticulated systems. Now, we just haven't, of course, if you're further away, it's going to cost a lot of money. So that is why it's taking a while to, to take on these subdivisions for residential purpose up there. But if we were to use decentralized systems, nature-based decentralized systems to take care of our waste, only such time when we can be uh, joined to the, the reticulated mains that's taking us to the main system, we, subdivisions can be designed in such a way that the 400 lots, 500 lots, 800 lots can service this decentralized waste treatment plant. I think that's something that we need to take seriously the technology is already out there. It's already happening here in Fiji. It needs to be, just be taken up one more notch. Um, make formal housing affordable. So yes, we have in the urban areas, we, let's just say you're given a house, you also have to pay rates and things like that. So if you're in a settlement and you get upgraded, formalized, at least the least we can do is introduce new rate systems to match the residential up, um, upgrading zone, so that so it might it will be lower than the normal residential um, rates, but at least the residents are participating and feel respected, and because they, now they're part of the whole system. Um, I would like to bring back advocate to bring back local government, um, as the example with the Lotoka. Uh, scenario during lockdown, it's, it's evident that local government um, is capable of looking after itself. They are, local government is the first step or first um, face of where the community goes to if they have questions from government. That is their first stop. There's no point jumping up to national government when the local government's there. And it's, once again, people they know, people they went to school, family, but it's, it's a shorter distance to get to local government. And again, in that, it's showing up in the markets that are popping up in the western side. Uh, they've been heavily hit because of the, the tourist, 
tourism um, industry collapsing. So at a local level, they are quite easily, um, can easily mobilize. Once again, um, urban centers, we say that they are engines of economic growth, local government at local level. Well, I think that local government needs to take a lead role in encouraging lo these local economies. Um, using science and technology, each, you know, each town is different. The, the th same thing we want to do in Singatoka might not be the same as in Rakiraki, let's just say. I'd like to give you an example of Savu Savu. You know, they've got the blue economy talk going on. It's littered with hot springs. I don't see why a smart kid, young person, clever, could harness the energy from the hot spring and do something to perhaps power uh, the street lights or something. If, if they can figure something out, it's sitting there, we're just waiting to be um, utilized. Same thing with Levuka. They could uh, bank on that, the history. They are a listed town. So use that as, as an economic thing. No other town in Suva has that privilege. Or, so let's um, get the engine of economic growth within our towns. The specific um, economies of each town should be um, worked on. Um, another thing I'd like to do is, and it was picked up by the other speakers, is on the use of real data. Um, bring it, uh, census data perhaps, but learn to analyze it. As a community, I would really like active, constructive public participation to be upfront. Let's learn how to constructively criticize projects and things and come up with solutions. It's, n it's no more a um, one-way street. We need to, yes, things are going down horribly, but do be constructive and come up with solutions. Because as some of the speakers have said, we know it already. It's just a matter of bringing it to the fore, if many of us bring it to the fore, and, and pushing it forward. Um, I think that's about it for now, um, and I'll be happy to add a few more um, uh, comments later. Thank you, Mary. Just one quick question before I open to the floor. Do you have any examples uh, in Fiji of well-designed developments or subdivisions? Are there any that we can look at? Oh, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of... Uh, I will go back. And strange enough, this is how I just see it, a very personal thing. Um, when you look at the, the Raiwanga, Raiwai area, yes, it was for social housing, but you'll be surprised there are laneways that, are, that you can walk from one side of Raiwanga through the, the subdivisions, uh, through the residence into the next subdivision without having to take a taxi. They are well-designed walkways. That rarely happens in subdivisions these days. Um, you can walk from Turac, from Flagstaff to Turac through the back way, well-formed footpaths, and these are from the olden days. Um, a good subdivision, well, I'm, I kind of like Ndenarao because everybody is expected to park in one specific area, leave your car there, go into Ndenarao and do your shopping with no worries of being run over or you know, your children wandering off. So these, these are just some of the examples. Um, that's okay. about it. I, I don't know if you've seen Koro Pita, which is outside of Lautoka. I think that to me, like I've never seen a waste solution like it. They have recycling. The gray water uh, feeds the, uh, the gardens uh, in the houses. So the, the gardens are full of food. And then the black water systems, which are centralized, actually end up feeding bananas and cassava. It's, it's absolutely yeah. amazing and inspiring. I think it's important to look at these examples of things that are working. From the floor. Yes, please. Um, I'm Vinaka Maruene Levy from uh, SIPO, Social Empowerment and Education Program. Uh, my question is uh, more um, at Dr. Sangita and Jody, if possible, in terms of uh, gender and inclusivity. Um, do you see the critical roles that women, especially younger women, play in rural communities in terms of um, monitoring natural resources 
fisheries and the impacts of development on their Golingoli food systems and livelihood. And going forward, how can we strengthen the recognition of their roles in national spaces? Thank you. Thank you. Can I take another question too? Sangita, you got that question? Lavetna Langiseru from the Alliance for Future Generations. Um, Charlie, you talked about whose vision, whose vision are we prioritizing? And uh, when we talk about vision, we talk about the future, and the future are young people. And we've realized that this is one of the vulnerable groups, uh, LGBTQI people, single mothers, single fathers, uh, sex workers, young people with disabilities, and they stand to face more disproportionately the effects of climate change, uh, mining, environmental pollution, and so forth. But they're also coming up with solutions. They're doing mangrove planting, tree planting, and other sorts of other environmental works, which Charlie, you mentioned, might seem noble, but is um, might not be the solution to what we're facing because it's a system that needs to change. And system is cannot change if people do not change because people are part of the system. And my question to the panels is, given the, the lack of investment on young people, there's so much potential, there's so much innovation and creati creativity with young people, where does the the gap lie? Is it with individual families? Is it within the curriculum sy system, uh, which Charlie you had alluded to earlier, or is it with the government? What is the challenge and how can that be best addressed? Mm. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. So we'll start off with Sangeeta. Okay. Um, so thank you for that question. It's my, one of my favorite topics. Um, so women in this country play a, just a massive role in our fisheries and it's very, their role is completely undervalued, it's underrepresented. They work across so many different fisheries um, and actually some of the studies that we've done and we've done recently this really large national study that's looked across something like 11 out of 14 provinces, women are engaged in a wider diversity of fisheries than actually men because they, will, they have so, they're very dominant in vertebrate fisheries, algae fisheries, but actually Compared to the past, they are moving further and further out to sea and are fishing out even into, into deeper waters. They play this massive role in especially our subsistence fishery. A lot of their catch goes to feeding the families and often this is something we just don't recognize. Again, because we tend to think of value in terms of money, or we don't think about food that is brought into the table. So I think that's the first point that I want to emphasize. And so given that they have this very important role, and often this role is very complementary to, to the men in their, in their community, the reality is their voice is very unheard. We don't have processes and really good systems in place to really facilitate and bring women's voices to the table around fisheries management. And we've got to get better at that. And I've recently done a kind of a, a, a study across Melanesia to look at that and to look at institutions. And I think the big challenge is that most of us that work on, for example, in fisheries, we've been trained as fisheries biologists, fisheries managers. None of us have received training around how to do gender and social inclusion. That has been largely through other, other sectors in the gender development group. And we need to find, we actually need to learn as a sector how to do that. Because what we're doing is the way, the approaches we are using, we think we're being gender inclusive, but actually a lot of the times they're just reinforcing um, the inequalities, we're not, we're not really creating the, opening the right doorways to allow their voices to be part of it. So if women are so part of fisheries, they've got to be there, we've got to find ways of them um, having an input into how resources are used, they need to be able to share how they use their resources, and they need to be part of the solution. And I just think it's crazy, you know, if you think about it, women make up half the population. As we th reset Fiji, how do we reset a country, our country if we tap into the innovations and the knowledge, the traditional knowledge, the innovations in only half the population? So we need to find ways both at the kind of local level, but also at the national level of bringing them into the dialogue. And I think a lot of this is, unfortunately, some harder things we're going to have to transform our institutions. Our institutions are just inherently, you know, biased. We have very male-dominated institutions. We have to look at the hierarchies. 
that are in there, and I think we're going to need to change that. Otherwise, it just makes it such a difficult pathway to be in it, to, to really bring women into the conversation. And I just want to emphasize, even though I've emphasized a lot about women, I equally think men need to be part of that conversation. So, you know, it's not about women advocating for women, it's also men that are need to advocate for gender equality, equality for both sexes. All right, and again, changing the system, I think a constant theme that's coming through. The second question, where are the gaps? Uh, maybe Skipper, you'd like to answer that, then go to Charlie. Thank you, thank you, Lani, for, for that question. I mean, um, it, it is a difficult question to answer because if you, as you rightly uh, po uh, pointed to the people are part of the system, eh? and the system is interconnected. I mean, from education, uh, and it's the, the notion of um, inclusivity. I think is, is cross-cutting in nature. But for me, where does we have to ask the question? Where does the bug end? And for me, it ends with the public officials, those that are elected to lead. Because at the end of the day, I mean, we are here, we're just discussing, um, suggesting, we're, we're actually suggesting um, solution, potential solution on how we could um, shape the future. But at the end of the day, it is the public officials that are mandated to make the decision to actually make the shift towards the future that we want. And that goes back to the, the point that I was talking to is we really need bold, political leadership and for our leaders to really listen that there are other people out there that are not part of government they have common sense solutions and and for them to really take the courage to to include these voices that are at the fringes in terms of thinking of okay. development solutions or ideas Thank does you. anyone else want to quickly add a point before we move to the floor on that question no, we'll take the uh, next question. Bula. Uh, my name is Krishna Sen, and I'm from Nandruga. Uh, I'm from the deaf community where deaf people cannot live without the important two things, that is uh, sign language and deaf culture. Thank you for all the fantastic speeches. I have a question for any of you. Uh, deaf community is the most marginalized group of the society and many, many relevant uh, organizations and stakeholders find hard to include reasonable accommodations as a way to make their climate change and environment work more inclusive because uh, of uh, costs, especially in this COVID-19 pandemic. It is important to note that persons with disabilities are not here to suit the needs of the society, but they must suit to the needs of persons with disability. Uh, how do you ensure the inclusion of persons with disability in your works in any other way? That's just my question. Thank you. Mary, I think uh, comes to some form of verbal planning. The response? I'm thinking of the design of our public spaces using technology and um, to be inclusive of the minority communi dis disabled community. Um, using technology, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get examples in my head going. Um, okay, any of the other panel? When we first started up the Utunialo, as um, I was introduced, um, I was the first captain on the Utunialo. Colin and I was approached by uh, a deaf uh, gentleman from our neighborhood in Lamy, Manasa, and he wanted to come sailing with us on the Utunialo to the United States and Galapagos and Cocos and everywhere. So Colin and I looked at each other and we were like, bro, how are we going to do this? You know, it's. Um, He's deaf. How are you going to communicate at night when it's um, dark, you know, because there's no light. You're sailing by sail. And, and you know what? We took Manasa on, and he was one of the best sailors that we ever had. You know, at night, even though we, he, we can't see each other, we just used to stamp on the deck, 
and he would know where that came from and he'd look straight at us and then we'd use sign language and know what to do and and yeah he traveled all around with us and um, that was something that made us appreciate um, you know he taught us a bit of sign language and all of these things I can tell a lot of stories about Manasa but um, that was my first exposure to something like that, you know, with fishing and eating out of the sea and bathing in salt water and all of those things. And I believe, you know, anybody can do anything. There's no, not, no such thing as a disability. You know, Absolutely. there should be no such thing as a disability. So if Manasa can do it, I'm sure anybody can do it. Could, sorry. Could, could I just add to that um, comment? I had asked about being having proactive pu public participation and this is a perfect avenue for the participation of all members of the community so that yeah. decision makers are aware of, of the, diff the array of, of people out there that they need to serve. So. Hmm. Yeah. Sankita, you had a point? So, I was going to say, you know, I think we do a really not a great job in, in my field, in the environment field, in terms of engaging um, the wide group of people in a, in a community. We tend to have worked with, used to working with the traditional systems, we tend to focus with, uh, you know, traditional leaders, and we often don't, are not been, been very good at including women, we haven't included other marginalized groups, and we haven't been very good as a sector in terms of including people who are living with disabilities. And I think, again, what, this, what we need is all of us, we've got to get out of our silos and start to really understand the, the, bowl, the, the larger kind of social community that we are part of, and we actually have to be, be proactive. So some of the things that we're committing to, like this year, and again, we're very new in this space, is that we're trying to get our staff to be more accountable. So when they go out, they need to now report back you know, when they went out and did their facilita facilitated their workshops, how did they assess who was in the community? Who turned up to the workshops? Not just who turned up, but who participated. And actually also to be accountable for who has been, you know, left out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to change our practice internally in organizations to be much more, you know, gender and socially inclusive in everything we do. And it's, it shouldn't be the responsibility of our ministry of of women or siloed with our, with our gender organizations. Like climate change, gender to me, social inclusion should be across all sectors. It's, it's something everyone should be doing. Thank you. And now, I, I think yeah. the, the best ideas come from people who are not the norm. People who are not the norm spend their time thinking of how to solve problems. So I think, yeah, we, we need to be getting the ideas from people who are on the fringes, on the outside. That's where we're going to see the changes coming from. Yep. Now, um, uh, a question I have, none from the floor. The government has put itself forward as a global leader in climate change. It reached the point that the Prime Minister himself was criticised for being away a lot uh, internationally for climate negotiations rather than being at home. They've introduced quite a number of policies, as some was mentioned, uh, including you know, the plastic bags, the uh, taxes on the environment. Um, some may say small steps, but it's, it's a positive step in the right direction, one would argue. So uh, I would like to ask the panel, how can government and the community build on what's already been done, or the mindset at least, that, that mindset that's there, to make sure that the climate actions and uh, policies, uh, or the actions, policies, uh, policies and actions on climate change and the environment are more effective from where they are now. Um, speaking from experience here, sometimes edu you can say education, but I think government needs to be more proactive on um, discipline because you can only educate so much. Um, take for example, just um, we had an oil spill in Sydney Harbour. If anybody's been to Sydney Harbour, I was on a container ship. It was way back in the early 2000s or whatever. Uh, 20 litres of diesel spilled overboard all right, into the Sydney Harbour. So now the chief engineer got fined 25,000 US dollars. The captain got fined 25,000 US dollars. The shipping company got fined like 100,000 US dollars just for 20 litres of diesel in the harbour. Right? And we were banned from Sydney Harbour for one year. 
we weren't allowed back into Sydney Harbour for one year. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at stuff like this, where government needs to come in, this is where they come in. This is revenue for them, because some companies, some people, they just take advantage of the lack of uh, discipline, and they continue to you know, pump oil out into the rivers and throw trash into the rivers without any care, because they know nothing's going to happen. Right, so government needs to be more stringent with discipline and fines, and really good fines, not $300 for a five-ton oil spill kind of a thing, and all these kind of things. You know, they keep saying $40 fine if you throw rubbish or if you spit, or all these kind of things, but you don't see anything coming out. There's no enforcement. You walk in the supermarket, there's nothing but undersized crabs and fish. There's no enforcement. Right, so I think um, for government, for their benefit in revenue, Fines would be the only thing to work. Apart from that, of course, education, education, education. They need to do a lot of education. Thanks. Anyone else, Charlie? Thank you. Thank you, Stanley, and thank you, Skipper, for that. Um, for, me, uh, for me, my my view is yeah, it's 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 good in terms of Fiji as the as a leader in the climate change world. But if you really look at it at the core, at the end of the day. Our government is responsible to us. It's not responsible for the whole world. It's responsible for its citizens. And it needs to start at home in terms of um, the kind of um, implementation or actions. If it wants to be um, um, effective, then it really needs to look at how things are done at home. We can't talk about climate change that we are we say we are we are the victim of this global disaster, but at the end of the day, we are talking mining. There's conflicting messages being sent at the international and at the local. We can't talk climate change, and we're still approving projects that damage reefs. So there's there's a need. For consistency? Us as a nation. Need for consistency? Yes, consistency and for us as a nation to really reevaluate and ask the question what kind of development are we envisioning for Fiji? Whose voices are we listening to? And who should be included? Mm. And, and, and I want to raise a point here that um, Mr. Faith Tevi um, highlighted last week in another discussion such as this. We need Talano, eh? and Talano is not only talking, eh? it's also listening, eh? active listening. I think it's about time that we as Fijian really, really have a talk on the kind of future that we want as Fijians without any other parties in the room that are forming the narrative on how we should be discussing this issue. Okay, great point. I'll take the final question from the audience. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, Hugh Gavin from the LMMA Network and a fellow at uh, USP. <laughs> I, uh, I think perhaps my question will become part of the answer to the, the, the your question you yourself raised there, but uh, I think we're all aware of, of the power that communities and individuals have in being part of the solution, and Fiji has been a world leader in demonstrating uh, some of that. Um, but there are limits to what communities and individuals can do, and I think in democracies, we choose, and we choose a government to fulfill duties that take up that slack, the limits that we cannot as individuals do. And one of those limits I think Sangeeta has raised, this is development. There is, whether it's a neoliberal or any other kind of economy, there's very likely to be massive pushes to, towards some sort of development that extracts resources and changes the environment. And there we usually have a series of functions delegated to government that uh, are meant to control and ensure that the impact of those developments are, are not excessive, do not undermine the basis for our lives. Uh, in Fiji, one of the lead organizations for this uh, role is the Department of Environment. It's not the only organization, but it would be the lead. Uh, five, six years ago, the Director of Environment stated he could not fulfill his obligations under the Environment Management Act for less than double his current budget at that time. So. One of the answers to the questions is, would be if you examined the budgets over the last five or six years, can you detect a significant increase in the government allocation to environmental regulation functions? I don't want to give away the answer. I've looked. They, they, you know, this, is, this would be a real indicator of doing what you're preaching. Have you invested more money 
in that. Uh, of course, it, environmental regulation, just like fisheries management, is not a vote winner. It's not a popular thing to do. So you could say, well, I understand how, how hard it may be to get a few extra dollars for that when, when people are interested in roads and health and so on. Having said that, I mean, we have just come out, we're in the middle of, in fact, uh, the COVID crisis issue where government has taken extremely bold and thankfully you know, successful so far action. Bold action in the sense that it's not nice for business and it's not a vote winner immediately. People do not like the rules that be imposed, but they've taken these very bold actions. And so my question was going to say, taking advantage of the fact that the government has shown its true leadership under this crisis and has been able to take bold and unpopular action, unpopular with both corporations and business and with, with the public, what specific actions do you think government could boldly take for the environment at the moment? We will uh, now take uh, comments, uh, final answers, any of final comments from the panel before we uh, finish off with the Reset Fiji panel on the environment today. Uh, Charlie. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think, Dr. Hill, uh, you, you answered that question quite clearly eh? in terms of the bold actions that are needed budgets. They need to put money where it's really needed. We have to identify where we could do the cuts. There are places where we could do the cuts and re-divert that resources to a sector that really needs it most. In terms of my final comment, um, bullet, uh, political leadership is very, very important. Um, listening is very, very important in terms of whose voices are we listening to, who should be here sitting at this table but is missing. Um, but because at the end of the day, in terms of shaping the future, I don't want to be accused by my daughters that, oh, daddy, you never did anything when you were given the privilege to, to influence the direction of where this country was going. I think it's, um, it's about trying to become, or rather thinking about what kind of ancestors we want to be remembered as. One that saw the problem but didn't do anything, or one that saw the problem and was bold enough and courageous enough to make changes. Thank you, Charlie. Sangeeta? Oh, a difficult question I know Hugh has asked. Um, I think we need right now the government to take much more bolder actions that are definitely around the environment you know, and see it as a resource that we've just repeatedly drawn down. It, we need to, not just the government, we all need to think about these resources and think about what we're leaving to the next generation. There's a lot of discussion around you know, what is fair for us as a generation to draw down versus what we should be leaving for our, for our children. So I think we need to be doing things like you know, making sure we've got the good management in place. It needs to start partnering stronger with local communities to do co-management that really works on, on the ground. Um, we need to be stop cut, you know, basic things, stop cutting down our mangroves. They're an important resource for so many different things. Let's get that mangrove management plan passed rather than sitting in, I don't know where it's sitting to be honest, but it, you know, you need to get those things moving forward. If we are truly committed, to the environment, we're truly committed and to what we're saying at a global, uh, at a global stage. And things like, our, I just want to end on our fisheries, we've got to, you know, we have these bans and things in place. As citizens, we need to follow them. You know, if there's a Kawakao and Donu ban right now, as far as I know, we need to start following that. You know, we, we shouldn't wait for our government to tell us to do the right thing. And at the same time, we shouldn't be lobbying the government to open these things up when they're there in in place to safeguard, you know, that, that fishery, safeguard the livelihoods of people in it. So I think there's a lot of different actions that can be taken, um, but those are just some examples, I think, moving forward. Skipper, Jonathan Smith, and I, and I also wanted to ask you about, uh, at this stage, what do you think are the biggest threats to our environment? Well, um, from my personal opinion, um, the biggest threats to our environment is poverty and uh, lack of education, All right? So, yeah, it's practically just us, humans. We're the biggest threats to the environment. Um, lack of education, the poverty, 
once we get all of that up, then you see the environment will be, get much better for sure. All right. Any final comments before we pass on to Jody? Thank you. Okay. Jody? Yeah, I agree with, um, with Captain. Uh, education is the most important thing that will set us up for the future. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, government, um, and it's not just government, it's, it's really all stakeholders. I want to see everybody getting around the table and communicating and uh, really sharing what the issues are, whatever segment of the society you're in. Um, and really coming up with solutions that work for everybody uh, and across supply chains. Um, I would love to see uh, investment policy married to sustainability policy. And then coming back to government, uh, I, I think that it's really important that uh, the, the government enforces policy but allows particularly private sector to get on with what they need to do and act as an enforcer and a regulator and to really trust that these new businesses which are coming online are going to do the right thing. Yes, we need to monitor, we need to enforce, we need to measure, but really to have trust that there is a lot of people out there who really want to bring change because as Charlie said, we don't want to be remembered by our ancestors as the people who had the last opportunity and, and messed it up. Um, and yeah, that, I think that's a really key point. Government speaking to business and really understanding what works and what doesn't work in terms of the policy making that's happening. Thank you, Mary. Okay, for that bold uh, initiative, I'm uh, of the 13 cities, 13 towns and cities in Fiji, I would like to see that their planning schemes, which are overdue for revision, to seriously put clauses and regulations in there, provisions, that mandate it to consider environment seriously in, in every assessment of a, a development application. There's no point, like what's happening right now is it's a, a flood overlay, let's just say. It says, no, sorry, you need to be six meters above high water mark. It doesn't matter whether you're right by the river or up for New River Hill somewhere. It's, six meters, you know, that type of figure. I would rather have it quite specific, uh, using science to say exactly where it is flood prone on my property, and then it dictates what type of materials I use to build my house. That kind of thinking is what I want, and that, in my view, is quite bold in, in, the, in the planning um, arena. But my um, pet one is that I really would like to see local government take the lead role in all decision making at local level um, because of that intimacy, because of its, its family and friends, and it's who we know in, at, at that level. So that's all. Thank you. Mary, Jody, Jonathan, Sangeeta, and Charlie. Thank you very much for joining us on this Reset Fiji panel on the environment. Next week, we have another exciting panel discussion, this time on innovation and technology. Make sure you stay tuned next week, uh, Sunday at 8 p.m. for that. But for now, for the Reset Fiji panel on the environment, good night. Mm -hmm.